Thank you for joining this demo presentation on critical race theory and environmental justice. As many of us are aware, there's a huge national conversation happening right now um, around critical race theory. And much of the conversation is unfortunately about how to shut it down. What I'm gonna argue through this presentation is that critical race theory, uh, for those of us who are interested in actual justice and repairing the harms of the past, is a powerful tool that we should embrace and not be running away from. And as I'll get into um, both here and in the longer presentation, there are many misconceptions around what critical race theory is and what it can mean for our movements for justice. But once we really understand what critical race theory is saying, I think we'll understand what a powerful tool it is for actually manifesting the justice that um, many of our communities desperately, desperately need. So first thing I'm gonna get into here is what is critical race theory? Because critical race theory is not just talking about history, which is um, what the mainstream media definition of it is. Pretty much uh, anytime you talk about racism or slavery or Jim Crow or Native American issues or anything that makes white people uncomfortable, that apparently is critical race theory. But in reality, critical race theory is an intellectual movement and a framework of legal analysis that grew out of the civil rights movement. And it was uh, what it originally was meant to do was help people understand that the legal institutions of the United States are inherently racist, which shouldn't be a stretch or a leap of the imagination when you consider how the country was founded and what's still happening today, George Floyd, et cetera. Um, racism is baked into the cake of the United States and critical race theory is an intellectual and legal framework for helping us to understand exactly how this works. Like how is racism baked into the cake of the United States? So critical race theory evolved from the critical legal studies movement, which examined how the law and legal institutions serve the interests of the wealthy. So that's very important. It really grew out of this uh, understanding where disparities come from. Where does inequality come from? And if you view race as a kind of a class-based system, you can understand that those who are at the bottom tier are lower class and those who are at the upper tier are upper class, right? And so mostly upper class people have the most resources and critical race theory is trying to help us understand how is all of this perpetuated through the law? This was also influenced by radical feminism. Um, and I think one of the main important contributions of radical feminism was helping us understand that um, forms of domination and oppression may be exercised or manifested in seemingly innocuous and largely unnoticed social practices. And this is very important when we talk about environmental justice and when we um, are examining where people live, how people live, and understanding that many of these um, disparities are not happening by accident. Some of these uh, situations that people are in may seem like, oh, it's their own fault or it's just randomly, thing, things are just randomly happening. That's not the case. So pollution exposure by population. This right here, uh, I think shows us how critical race theory can be useful for those who care about environmental justice. Because when you look at these figures, Latinx people, black people, exposed to 63% more pollution and 56% more pollution than non-Hispanic white Americans who are exposed to 17% less pollution than they actually produce. We have to understand how we arrived at this situation where people of color are being exposed to so much more pollution than white people. Is it just happening accidentally or is there something about the structure of the law the structure of our society that is producing this outcome. So modern air pollution disparities. This is very important because um, as you can see from this map on the left, you can see the red lining. And what this shows us here is that uh, communities of color in the United States are systematically exposed to higher levels of air pollution all across the country. And in other presentations, I get very deeply into redlining and I will go into it a little bit here. But redlining was a legal practice of denying um, 
people of color access to to loans and financial um, incentives for improving their their you know their community. It's a very race based and ethnicity based way of discriminating against people, and it was legal. It was a legal framework, right? So, in the 1930s, the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation worked with the federal government to kind of set up the situation where people were kind of trapped in these, you know, decaying neighborhoods. And today, most of the neighborhoods that were redlined are also, coincidentally, the ones that are experiencing the most harm from air pollution. And so critical race theory helps us to understand how redlining as a legal practice produced the outcome that we have today of black and brown people being exposed to more air pollution. There's a direct correlation there. But if we don't take uh, critical race theory seriously, we won't make these important connections, right? So Segregation by Design is a very important book by Jessica Traunstein. Gets into how um, you know, so-called urban development of the 50s and 60s was a direct uh, you know, response to the Great Migration and to uh, Black people fleeing the South and moving into the northern cities like Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Chicago, et cetera. And how in all of these cities, coincidentally, you have all of these huge ghettos for some reason. And in this presentation and the longer presentation, what I'm going to get into is how the law helped us set up these ghettos and how in these ghettos, people are exposed to more pollution, more crime, more dumping, more trash, more everything. These things aren't just randomly happening, folks. These things are not just randomly happening. The law of the land set us up for the situation that we're living in today. And we have to understand how that works if you want to actually fix the situation. In 1979, 1979 in Houston, people were fighting this fight way back then, right? So you look in this diagram on the left, you can see the, uh, the names of the neighborhoods, the ethnicity of the neighborhood, the type of facility that they want to put in the neighborhood. And you can see all these neighborhoods are mostly black, right? Incinerators, landfills. I mean, we're, we're seeing this right now in Chester, PA, where Chester, PA is a mostly black um, city near Philadelphia, has multiple incinerators, multiple trash dumps. Um, how do we arrive in a situation where all of these harmful, polluting industrial facilities keep being somehow placed near black neighborhoods? Is, is this uh, just a coincidence? How do we have a situation where we have uh, Native Americans on reservations with no running water? Is, is this just ha happening randomly? I think what we're saying, what we're seeing when we really examine some of these historical situations is that the law, the law of the land helped produce these disparities and these harms on these communities. And it's the law that needs to be changed. And in some cases it was changed, but not without a huge fight. Very interesting. And in our uh, longer presentation, we're gonna dive deeply into some of these historical scenarios. So here in uh, Philadelphia, we have a great city council person named Helen Gim, and she is very clued in to the need for environmental justice. And this is uh, an example of what we need our politicians to be doing. So uh, you see that she announces a Community Health Act. She really lays out what the, what the Community Health Act will mean for the people in the community. Um, we need more of our politicians to be taking environmental justice seriously. And I think looking at the situation in our communities through the lens of critical race theory will help us make the case. It will help us make the argument for why we need more resources, for why we need more politicians to pay attention to this. Here's another aspect of how I feel uh, CRT in connection with uh, environmental justice will lead to action. Once people understand the depth and the breadth of the uh, dispossession that they've experienced through the law because of racism in the law, this will help people to take action because once people understand that they're being screwed over, 
they're going to want to get up and say, hey, listen, we're not going to we're not going to take this anymore. And this is what's happening already around the country. We have people locking down, blocking pipelines, laying in the street, doing everything they can to protect their communities and protect their health from the ravages of the fossil fuel companies and corporations and so forth.